Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. My name is Andrew Tobin, and I'm a partner specialising in insurance and reinsurance in Mills and Reeves, London office. Today's session is one way. You can see me, but I can't see you. The session is being recorded, and a link to the recording with the slides will be sent out um, with the follow-up email. Today's presentation is about 20 minutes long. If you have questions, please type them into the question and answer box where my colleague Harriet Strevens will collate them for me to deal with at the end. Also, feel free to contact me directly after the session if you want to discuss anything in more detail. Today's topic is political violence and insurance. It was originally envisaged to be a single session, but which on reflection we now think is better to divide up. So today's presentation will be the first in a series of short talks concerning this subject. So why have we decided to discuss this topic? Well, it's important firstly, because virtually every standard insurance and reinsurance policy underwritten worldwide contains extensive exclusions for political violence perils. And on the rare occasions that they need to be dusted off, understanding them is very important. It's also important because a specialist political violence insurance market has emerged, especially since 9-11, that is prepared to provide insurance for the gaps in cover caused by the extensive exclusions that appear in standard insurance policies. And London, and Lloyd's in particular, is undoubtedly the global centre for underwriting those political violence risks. On a personal level, it's also a subject that I've taken a special interest in throughout my career. I was involved in various disputes concerning the World Trade Centre attack. Uh, I was the deputy editor of the Insurance Institute of London's book on war risks and terrorism, published in 2008, and have advised many insurers and reinsurers on coverage issues in this field, including in respect of the Thailand riots of 2010, the Arab Spring claims, uh, tribal attacks on energy infrastructure in Asia, as well as on some matters currently impacting the market. So in today's introductory session, we will have a look at the detailed history of political violence and insurance, which will bring us naturally to a discussion about the current standard non-marine political violence exclusion, the NMA 2918, which I can, will try and lift the lid on a little. And then finally, I will try to answer some questions. Um, we've come at the topic this way because in my view, if one wants to understand what cover political violence insurance products provides, it's necessary first to understand how and why political violence perils are excluded from regular insurance products because it's those exclusions uh, that carve out gaps in cover that creates the demand for political violence insurance. So looking back to the 17th and 18th centuries, when Lloyd's was engaged only in marine insurance business, no particular distinction was made between standard marine policies on the one hand and war risks or political violence policies on the other. Rather, the traditional Lloyd's marine policy covered 15 named perils, many of which related to war, piracy and violence on the high seas. And given how violent the world was, those elements of cover were the most prized parts. Indeed, the loss of vessels to privateers, by which I mean state-sponsored pirates, accounted for the majority of Lloyd's underwriting losses over the 18th century taken as a whole. And if you're interested, the picture on the slide is of the American privateer Yankee hero engaging the British frigate Milford off the coast of Massachusetts in 1776, an engagement that ended badly for the British, I'm afraid. Lloyd's underwriters at that time did not seek to exclude any of the politically violent elements of cover, but rather found it profitable to include them in conjunction with all of the other perils of the sea. 
and indeed they would issue a single policy and charge a single premium for, the, for them all. The Napoleonic Wars was probably the most profitable time in Lloyd's history due to the worldwide danger to shipping posed by the war, the massive increase in commodity prices and limits on underwriting capacity, all of which combined to enable huge premiums to be charged. If we fast forward to the 1890s, ships had multiplied, become steel hulled, steam powered, um, much larger, more valuable and with much greater cargoes than 80 years previously. The first submarines had been launched and political tensions, particularly between Britain and France, nearly led to war on several occasions. Uh, in light of that, Lloyd's underwriters became very concerned that the risk of war now posed a systemic risk to their business. So in 1898, at a general meeting of Lloyd's, all underwriters agreed to exclude war risks from all standard marine hull and cargo policies using a standard form of policy wording. It was still possible to buy war risk insurance at Lloyd's, but only by a special endorsement for which a separate premium would be charged. And to this day, the marine market remains divided into the hull market, which, was, which does not cover war and other political perils, and a separate war risk market, which does. But my focus today and in the next sessions is really on non-marine insurance, which is where most of the developments have been in recent years. The history of political violence insurance in the context of a non-marine business is rather shorter than in the marine world, and indeed Lloyd's only started underwriting non-marine business in the 1890s, albeit in competition with a burgeoning number of insurance companies which were already doing so. And as far as we can tell, most non-marine insurers covered damage to property without necessarily excluding war or any other perils related to political violence, although some exclusions seem to have been used on an ad hoc basis. And broadly, that was the position of non-marine insurers right up until 1915, when German Zeppelin bombers attacked the London docks. Uh, that panicked the property insurance market into quickly excluding liability for aerial bombardment, war, and uh, various other uh, peril, political violence perils, even in domestic insurances. But enterprising underwriters at Lloyd's quickly saw an opportunity to sell a standalone policy that would specifically cover damage for those air raids and other war risk perils. And given that everybody wanted insurance against Zeppelin raids and that Zeppelins did little damage to insured overall, it was a very profitable business, for the, especially for the insurers who uh, started underwriting this business first. Um, but it didn't take long before other insurers piled into the business as this rather alarming advert for the British and Dominion's in insurance company shows. I don't know if you can see it, but the, the poster on the left says, your fire policy does not cover you for acts of war. And it then goes on to give details of the policy and the premium. Um, you could even buy one from the Daily Mail, one of these policies. And you can see on the right side how a Dublin broker tried to cash in on both the war and the political instability in Ireland by selling insurance at Lloyd's for war, rebellion, riots, and even invasion. So these were the first um, political violence policies that were underwritten on the non-marine side at Lloyd's. Uh, after the war, Lloyd's insurers were engaged in a scramble for new business, and it seems that they fell over themselves to write more and more comprehensive policies, including cover for war and other kinds of political violence in many of the world's political hotspots where the highest premiums could be earned. And that situation continued until 1936, or 1937 when the Spanish Civil War and the Sino-Japanese Wars broke out. Uh, those wars not only caused uh, claims 
but more importantly, they caused insurers to realize the scale of the risk to their business posed by the new methods of mechanized warfare, especially the strategic bombing by modern aircraft of city centers and other insured targets hundreds of miles from their bases. And so in 1937, the then chairman of Lloyd's led the way in persuading all UK insurers and more than 300 international insurers to exclude all war and other political violence perils, um, as they were understood at the time, in all non-marine policies. And given that the Second World War broke out only nine months later, with hindsight, their agreement was a very prudent one. Now, further to that agreement, the London Non-Marine Underwriters Association agreed a standard form of political violence exclusion the NMA 464, which is shown on the slide, and you'll see is dated the 1st of January 2000, uh, 1st of January 1938. And the NMA designation is the Non-Marine Association. I've put the clause on the slide in full, but won't read it all out, but you can see that it excludes losses directly or indirectly caused by a long list of perils. Um, for example, war, civil war, rebellion, revolution, um, uh, usurped power, uh, and so on. And that clause was attached to virtually every non-marine policy issued in London from 1938 until the World Trade Center attacks of 2001. Now, given the huge sums involved in the insurance claims arising out of those attacks, this clause was scrutinized very closely um, efforts were made to argue that the 9-11 attacks were excluded because they were said to be acts of war. Uh, there was even an argument that the attacks uh, were some form of form of riot uh, and subject to a riot sublimit. But all of those cases failed uh, and the claims were paid by the ordinary property insurance market because the NMA 464 did not exclude acts of terrorism, uh, at least in the United States, although in, in the United Kingdom, terrorism had been excluded for some years in, in light of IRA attacks. Uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, many general insurers concluded that this new threat of mega terrorism was simply uninsurable. And so the exclusions were revised and expanded to also exclude terrorism. And in the London market, the NMA 2918 emerged as one of the market standard exclusions, and which has been exported now into millions of policies throughout the world and in many languages on the back of reinsurance. And I set out the full clause on the slide. Uh, I, I apologise that it's, it's rather wordy and you may not be able to see it all, but we will break it up. We will break up each element to look at in more detail in later sessions. But for now, I'd just like to highlight four features of this ubiquitous but often poorly understood exclusion. Firstly, note that the exclusion uh, applies to loss that is either directly or indirectly caused by an excluded peril. The word indirectly was very deliberately chosen by the draftsman to make it much easier for insurers to rely on the exclusion. English and Commonwealth courts have confirmed that this reference to indirect causation amends the usual rule that the insurer must prove that a loss was approximately caused by an excluded peril. Rather, it enables insurers to reach back further into the chain of causation so as to find an excluded peril that had only an indirect link with the actual damage. So this one word, uh, indirectly, displaces the usual proximate causation rule and can have a very significant effect on coverage disputes in practice. So, for example, to, um, even where a proximate cause of loss may be, may be a covered peril, such as rioting, looting or fire, uh, 
the loss will nevertheless still be excluded if the indirect cause was one of the excluded perils. So, for example, rioting indirectly connected to a rebellion or indirectly connected to an uprising will be excluded, even though rioting itself was a covered peril. And we can look at some examples um, of this with cases in, in, in the next session. And it's fair to say that there are some limits as to exactly how far back in the chain of causation uh, one can reach. But uh, we'll, look, we'll look at that in the next session. Secondly, the clause contains a long list of political violence perils, none of which are defined on the face of the clause, and some of which to appear to be very obscure to ordinary readers, such as um, usurped power, for example. Uh, and the perils are, well, they're, they're on the slide, war, invasion, hostilities, rebellion, uh, civil commotion, assuming the proportions of or amounting to an uprising, um, and so on. Um, so wh why were they, those terms not defined? Well, I, I suspect the drafters of this wording were happy not to add definitions because most of the words describing the excluded perils had already been considered by English courts at the time the clause was drafted. And in fact, the meaning of most of them is quite settled as a matter of law. Um, and I will look at the specific meaning of each peril uh, in, in the later sessions. But the practical point for now is that if you need to understand what these words mean, then it's necessary to find to, to refer to case law to find out. A dictionary is unlikely to help. Thirdly, note that terrorism now appears as an exclusion, where it was not mentioned in the NMA 464. Terrorism is a relatively modern concept and had no settled common law meaning, so the drafters needed to define what it meant. And Unsurprisingly, given that it was drafted in the aftermath of 9-11, they defined it very broadly indeed, so as to mean an act of terrorism means an act, including but not limited to the use of force or violence or the threat thereof, of any person or groups of persons, whether acting alone or in behalf of or in connection with organisations or governments, committed for political, religious, ideological, or similar purposes, including the intention to influence any government and or to put the public or any section of the public in fear. Again, uh, I'd like to look at this clause further in due course, but for now, I would simply observe that it's very, very wide and is capable of encompassing all kinds of violent activity that has a political, religious, or ideological, or similar motivation, and not simply the activities of uh, the terrorist groups that you might have in your mind's eye. Fourthly, uh, note the reverse burden of proof clause, which says, if the underwriters allege that by reason of this exclusion, any loss, damage, cost, or expense is not covered, by this insurance, then the burden of proving the contrary should be on the assured. And that is another method used by the drafters of the clause to make it easier for insurers to invoke this exclusion. And one doesn't tend to see this in regards to any other types of exclusions in policies. It seems usually only to be deployed in this political violence exclusion. But this drafting has been upheld and applied by the English courts and in practice can also have a very significant effect on the outcome of coverage disputes uh, because it tilts the, essentially tilts the balance very significantly uh, in favour of insurers. And again, it's something I'd like to look at in more detail in the next session with, with some examples. Um, so, well, um, I think I've now used up my, 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 my 20 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found that introduction to be um, uh, uh, of some use. But in the, in the next sessions,
Uh, we're going to look at the meaning of each of those perils. We'll look at the concepts of direct and indirect causation a bit more closely with some practical examples, uh, as well as the um, reverse burden of proof. But um, uh, in the meantime, uh, I'd be interested to see if there, if there have been any questions, which I'm happy to take now, uh, Harriet. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. There, there are a couple of questions. The first question is posed as follows. What kinds of evidence do insurers need to rely on these exclusions? Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, the, the broad answer to which is that insurers need to uh, do their best to obtain whatever credible and compelling evidence they, they, can, they can get their hands on. Not only do they need to look at the proximate cause, but they also will need, they may also need to have evidence of the indirect cause of loss. <coughs> now, in many situations, it's not that hard to identify what the proximate cause is, because if a building has been burnt down, then the, it's lost by fire. If a shop is empty, it's lost by looting, um, or, uh, or, or it could, could also be by, by riot, for example. But um, that's not necessarily the end of the analysis for these exclusions, because the question is, what was the indirect cause? What was the backdrop against which those um, immediate causes of loss occurred? And it's very unlikely that insurers are going to get first-hand evidence from the, any of the participants in these affairs. You can't really get witness statements from rioters or demonstrators, although these days they may leave a trail of evidence on, on, on social media. Um, but one needs to build a picture. So typically one starts with um, uh, news reports from credible sources, uh, then uh, expert uh, and academic input can be helpful and so on and so forth. So one, one just tries to uh, find as much credible evidence as possible that will be persuasive to, to a court. Thank you. What about the way in which exclusion clauses work under foreign law as my second question? Um, well, that's also a good question because these London wordings or wordings devised in London, probably the majority of them are used overseas because the majority of um, business underwritten at Lloyd's and in the London market is, is non-UK business. Um, so it's very often the case um, that we're involved in cases um, con concerning foreign law. Now, um, as far as the United States is concerned, um, that they, they also have a body of case law looking at these clauses uh, and perils and causation and so on. Broadly speaking, their case law is, is similar to ours and indeed cross refers to ours, although there are differences in detail. Um, there are cases in the Commonwealth um, reported cases in the Commonwealth on these subjects and uh, those cases are, are in line with the English cases. But there are also cases in the civil law world, um, uh, such as uh, Latin America, for example, uh, or, or in continental Europe, um, where, uh, where, where, where these clauses uh, have not been subject to particular judicial def uh, interpretation. There, there are no clear uh, definitions under, under local law uh, and so on. So uh, as London lawyers or London insurers trying to in rely on these clauses and perhaps obscure concepts such as um, uprising or um, usurped power or, or so on, uh, uh, may need to uh, try to rely upon uh, the English cases to persuade the foreign court what the parties intended to do. So the argument would tend to go, well, along the lines of, well, there is no local law, but uh, these policies 
were negotiated in London, and even though your law applies in the absence of any useful commentary in your law, it's likely that the parties intended these wordings to have the same or similar meaning that they would have under English law. And so in that way, one tries to persuade um, these overseas courts to take account of the English cases and, and indeed in some cases the, the US cases. So it's not a straightforward answer, clearly. Um, well, it, it's, di it's difficult to guarantee, it's, it's difficult to know the extent to which um, your submissions uh, will be taken into account by those overseas courts. But uh, uh, given that we, we often have a lot of law and practice on these points, often a very compelling picture can be built up. Yeah. Well, we look forward to hearing more about the case law next time round, but in keeping with our usual aim to be within our time frame, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for for the moment. So can I pass back the baton to you to close down, Andrew? Uh, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please do... Uh, connect with me on, on LinkedIn uh, and send me any further questions. Also, if you'd like to have a more detailed discussion about any of this, then, then please do get in touch directly with me.